Welcome to the reInvent Nuclear Security Series, the launch of the series. I'm Peter Leiden. I'm the founder of reInventors. Now, reInventors has held dozens and dozens of these round, virtual roundtables over the last couple of years here. And uh, we've actually held, had a full slate of series of, series of these roundtables in the last year. But with the launch of this reInvent Nuclear Security Series, we really are, by far, this is our most ambitious and potentially our most promising series yet. I mean, it's ambitious in that we are really trying to solve one of the most complex and important challenges facing the, the world today, which is really to stop the proliferation of nuclear weapons and figure out a way to, over time, get rid of them all together. This is a really difficult comp uh, challenge, and we really have a lot of work to do to get, make it the end game work here. Now, on the other hand, it's the most promising in that we are partnering here for this series with N Square, uh, which is a new organization that is backed by five of the largest uh, peace and security funders in the, in the world, really. We've got uh, Plowshares Fund. We've got the MacArthur Foundation. We've got the Skoll Global Threats Fund. Uh, we have the um, uh, Carnegie Corporation of New York. And we've got the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. I mean, this is an awesome group of backers for this initiative, this round, these series of roundtables, and for the next two years also what N-Square is all about. And so we are honored to actually have this group backing this, and we're really excited about the possibilities here. Now, I am also thrilled to turn over the hosting of this series to someone who's extremely capable. Uh, she will be the host of the entire series. She is the executive director, director of this new organization called N-Square, and it's Erica Gregory. I've watched her and known her over the years, and there are few people who are as good as her as bringing together smart folks to collaborate on solving complex problems. And so we're in good hands here for the series over the next three months. So Erica, do you want to take it from here, and uh, let's have a good session. That's great. Well, thanks for that nice introduction. Uh, so, as Pete said, um, I have this extraordinary opportunity uh, to lead a pilot program for the next uh, two years. Uh, we have, I like to say, we have a little bit of money and a little bit of time uh, to do some pretty cool stuff, uh, which is about catalyzing and facilitating innovation in nuclear security and nonproliferation, which it involves a whole lot of issues, which I know are not necessarily accessible to people who don't do this work every day, so I think we'll unpack that over the course of the series. Uh, but our job is to find some of the most promising new ideas and attract what we hope is some promising new partners, uh, and then, yes, we get to fund some of those ideas going forward. Um, really, the way I think about this is that uh, with an initiative like this, I don't have the luxury <laughs> Uh, and my colleagues don't have the luxury over the next two years of choosing between two really important issues. But in fact, we have to manage a dilemma. Uh, and these two issues are the world would like many of us, maybe even most of us around the world, would like to see a future in which we don't depend on nuclear weapons at all. We'd like to see them go away. And it's also true that in the present, we really have a responsibility to keep the globe safe from the potential of nuclear catastrophe. So we don't get to choose between those two things. And our hope is that innovation and new partners like folks who are tuning in uh, to this series uh, will help us manage that dilemma effectively over the course of our lifetimes. Um, so with that, I really have to say thank you to um, all of the funders that uh, Pete mentioned earlier, but particularly Bruce Lowry, who's with us today uh, from the Skoll Global Threats Fund. Uh, and Bruce joins us as he's the uh, Policy and Communications Director at Skoll Global Threats, but also has a, a career in the U.S. Foreign Service, so he brings a really important perspective to this issue. Um, so having done that, I will introduce our anchor for this series today, or for the episode today, and that's Paul Sappho. Uh, he'll be familiar to many of you, I'm sure, watching. He's a longtime and very highly regarded technology forecaster. He's a professor at Stanford University. Uh, he chairs the Future Studies and Forecasting uh, Department at Singularity University. And for uh, at least a couple decades, he's been helping governments and corporate clients think about the dynamics of uh, large-scale change uh, over time. And uh, I happen to know he's also a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council and um, at the Royal Swedish 
Engineering Academy, or Academy of Engineering Sciences, I think is the way it goes. So with that, uh, we're going to put uh, ourselves in your hands to launch us into this discussion, Paul. Oh, hey, Paul, I think you're, uh, yep. Myself. There we there go. go. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's great to lead this off, particularly because uh, I get to talk for a few moments here and then sit back and listen carefully to the other, other uh, colleagues on this call. Framing the issue, I think of it as this is a moment where we're poised on the edge of the third age of nuclear weapons. If you look back, the first age was 1945 to 1989. That was nukes as deterrence. It was a small club, five nations, the United States, uh, USSR, UK, France, and China. And not coincidentally, those were also the five permanent members of the Security Council. Uh, so it was... It was an age, as uh, Kenneth Waltz described it once, of nuclear peace. Arguably, deterrence worked. Then we entered a second and very different age, starting after 1989, with the waning of superpower uh, control of geopolitics. I think that was the age of nukes as geopolitical prestige. And the nuclear club grew. And I mean prestige in the sense that Nukes were the Ferraris of, of na national power and weaponry, and Ferraris in the sense that they were a source of prestige if they were unused. But the moment one used them, then that became anti-prestige and you'd become a pariah. So there was a strong incentive to make a nuclear weapon if you could. Uh, look at the fact Iraq did not have nuclear weapons. It got invaded. North Korea and others had arguably weapons, did not get invaded. Uh, and so it was a success story in that people were making weapons, but there was a strong incentive not to use them. I mean, who would blow up their Ferrari if you were a, the despot leader of, of a country? Um, we're in a third age now, and that's it's been called loose nukes or nukes for the rest of us, a very different world where non-state actors are be tr attempting to get their hands on nuclear devices. And when I say nukes, I, of course, include um, dirty bombs and things that are not strictly a nuclear weapon but have the capacity to freak people out. The danger in this world is that once a non-state actor gets a weapon, there's probably a very strong incentive to use it as quickly as possible because they have the knowledge that everybody is going to be chasing them down to try and get it back. So that's a new and very different kind of dynamic. I should add that um, the, uh, the, the nation states, the nuclear superpowers, uh, have actually done a good job in the second age of nukes as geopolitical prestige to keep things under control. And there's still role for nation state. But as, as you've implied, Erica, we need new ideas. This is a, a new world. Are there some technologies that can help with this? Uh, what are the broader things that are interesting? And just a little bit of history here. Uh, it's also important to think about alternative scenarios. Scenario planning and the field that I'm a professional in, future studies, was actually invented by Herman Kahn at the Rand Corporation in response to um, the nuclear crisis. And there was a lot of social technology used in the last several decades. We need to think about our new social tools as, as well. Um, and at the end of the day, we think if we can use technologies to also um, uh, think about changing human attitudes. Uh, for me, a success, success factor would be to reach as far up the chain as we could go and use social media to, for example, make the thought of using nukes as uncool as, say, Stalinism. So I think with that, I'll hand it back to you, Erica. Well, actually, before we jump, oh, before we actually jump into the discussion, and, and Erica's running uh, with the ball here, why don't we just go around the table? We have an amazing group of folks here, and I think it'd be just great for everyone to just introduce themselves briefly before uh, Erica jumps into the discussion. So, 
Reese, why don't you give a little bit of well, what we like to say here is who you are and what you bring to the table that's relevant to the topic here. Just a short intro. Um, well, I have a background in biophysics, um, uh, nuclear biophysics in particular uh, at Berkeley. And my hobby um, in college was being a phone hacker, uh, which led me into inventing things that helped uh, build the internet and social networking and so forth. Um, and in particular now I'm interested in the sort of evolution of uh, humans and, uh, and from a social and biological point of view and, and some of these cultural things like uh, nuclear weapons and how they're handled uh, uh, plays into that. So I, I look forward to this group discussion and um, uh, I think this is an important problem that, that uh, is sort of not thought about as broadly in the public discussion as it should be. Sean, why don't you give us a little sense of your background? Oops, you're muted. There we go. Hey, um, yeah, great to be here, and, and, and thanks, everyone, for sort of putting this all together. Um, my background is a PhD in physics, um, which I, I guess started off much more on the, uh, the experimental and kind of classical physics um, approaches, but later morphed into um, applying some of those techniques and tools into understanding the nature and dynamics of insurgency, looking for mathematical structures and the way conflict and terrorism unfolds around this planet. And how conflict is unfolding um, across this planet. So for me, um, now looking at nuclear weapons, particularly as um, certain variants of those weapons get into the hands of terrorist groups, um, I think we're uh, in, into a place where um, you know, it's going to be an interesting, uh, an interesting thing to try and monitor, and I think a lot of tools and techniques from big data are going to be able to uh, shine some lights um, onto those uh, to those patterns. Great, We're eager to hear that. Uh, Bree, you want to jump in? Sure. Am I unmuted? Great. So I'm Bree Lincoln Hoker, and happy to be here. Um, I have to say, I wasn't quite sure what you would want with a neuroscientist turned strategy consultant on this panel, but maybe we'll have something to say about decision making, which is a topic that I'm very interested in. So um, neuroscience kind of sits at the intersection between biology and the cognitive sciences. Um, my interests also span those domains. So. Um, in the time since I've been in graduate school, um, and I should say in grad school I did both neuroscience and international policy, I've seen the science of decision making move from um, a formal science where we talked about mutually assured destruction in game theory to a very different kind of science that is much more focused on what's going on in the brain, what the social influences are all around us, and increasingly now, it's moving into the science of decision making using data, decision making by agents that are not human. Um, so I think all of those areas kind of come together um, in useful ways around the question of nuclear nonproliferation. I'm not quite sure how they all come together, but um, I think that there's some really interesting ideas about decision making, what we're learning about decision making within individual humans that can be really relevant. So I hope we kind of go there. I'll also say um, in another phase of my life, um, I was very interested in biological threats worldwide. And I think that there may be some things that we can learn um, about nuclear nonproliferation and tracking transparency, security, from thinking about biological threats um, and the different kinds of biological threats that might be closer to or further away from the nuclear threats that we're going to be facing in the next 10 to 20 years. Fascinating. Great to have you here. Um, John Perry Barlow. People know you for various things, but what, what do you bring to the table on this nuclear nuclear thought thinking? Well, I uh, I was uh, very deeply involved with Dick Cheney back when he first ran for Congress from Wyoming, uh, and that involvement eventually developed into uh, uh, a bitter uh, but collegial at first argument about basing the MX missile, which was, a, which was a missile designed to make up for the fact that the Air Force didn't have submarines uh, and they wanted to have a second strike weapon so they were going to build a railroad that, that uh, went all over Nevada, Oregon, Wyoming, Utah, and uh, uh, I believe uh, part of, Nevada, uh, part of uh, uh, Arizona. And I was opposing it 
primarily on environmental grounds. It was going to take all of the water in, in the known aquifers to put in all the concrete that was going to be uh, poured for this. But it also, I, I just had children, and I realized that I had spent my entire life with a kind of aching certainty that sooner or later in my lifetime, the human race, somebody would screw up, and the human race would blow itself up. And that was just something that was going to happen. And I think it's extraordinary. I think uh, everybody my age felt that to some degree, and the fact that nobody talks about the the scar that that has to have left on all of us seems a little odd to me. But anyway, I I became very uh, very well schooled on the MX, and you know to such an extent that that uh, you know I was I was debating Cheney about it. Uh, in, in public outside of Wyoming, uh, I, I learned a lot about nuclear strategy. There, I, I also became very uh, conscious of Star Wars and was uh, was lobbying a lot uh, on Capitol Hill uh, against uh, 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 various folks that I that I still know, like Pete Warden down at NASA Ames. In any case, uh, the I became very convinced that, that something had to be done about this, and and uh, I put a lot of my life and energy into it, and then suddenly the Cold War was over, and well, I thought, fine, the, if, I don't have to worry about that anymore. It's it's all gone away, and I didn't find it particularly uh, believable that there was going to be uh, a lone. Uh, madman with a nuclear weapon. I mean, it's easy enough to make a nuclear weapon. I could do it if you gave me, you know, five kilograms of, of weapons-grade uranium. But uh, the I didn't I didn't think that was very credible. Uh, well, John, hey, John, let's just ju I, yeah. you've given a good insight into your history. Sorry, here. So yeah. What we got? Let's get into. Let's, we're going to bring it up to the okay. present here. But a good, interesting background there. And what we got to do is we got to get Greg in here, and then we're going to jump into the conversation. But thanks for giving that little quick note. Okay, sorry. Greg, jump in and hey, give you uh, a Sure. I'm Greg Petroff. Um, I'm a designer uh, and architect by background. Uh, my particular interests right now have to do with um, giving people human agent, uh, giving humans agency uh, when we connect sort of 50 billion devices to the Internet. Uh, and machine learning starts to take over, um, how do we make decision-making something that's useful and how do we give people meaningful work uh, in what they're doing? And so the area that I'm sort of focused in is, uh, you know, what happens, you know, as we put these sensor networks and machines connected, um, how, do we, how do we as human beings, you know, kind of evolve with that um, moving forward? Great to have you here. Now, before we jump into the discussion with Erica, I will say this, as smart as the group is here, no one's as smart as everyone, as we th say around here. There's a lot of folks watching who might have great ideas, great questions. We do have people monitoring um, the G Plus environment, the Reinventors environment. You can comment there, ask questions there. You can use the hashtag Reinventors in Twitter. We also have people watching that. If it's relevant, we'll swing it into the conversation potentially. But if not, we'll certainly use it as our, our later packages. We do our write-ups and videos that come out of this too. So uh, feel free to give your ideas. So Erica, Erica, it's all yours. It's all yours. Okay. okay. Well, that's good. Well, that's good. I'll set in the, set in the viewers. Um, okay, good. So I'm going to start by uh, doing a kind of broad survey. And the way I'd like to do this is just think of this as a round robin. Uh, we're going to do this relatively quickly, and then we're going to figure out where we want to dive a little deeper. All right? So I so the I, first thing I have to do is when we take the broad, broad which, what's on the horizon technologically that we ought to be paying attention to. Uh, and we, at this point, is the public writ large. Let's not worry about those folks who are toiling in the nuclear security domain, but just broadly, what's most interesting over the next 10 years? And um, Paul, I wonder if you could kick us off and get us thinking uh, on that plane for a bit, and then I'll, I'll go around the circle and hear from everybody. 
Sure. Well, I we will get deep into sensors and robots. You know, of course, the first thing that comes to mind is that marvelous 1950s film, The Day the Earth Stood Still, when John Rennie, the alien, stepped out of the spacecraft with his robot companion, Gort, and introduced Gort to the Earthlings as a member of the intergalactic robotic peace force that would keep us all in line, that everybody had ceded their power to these robots and nobody dared uh, launch a nuke and he was here to introduce himself to the newly nuclear Earth. I'm sure we'll go that way, but I, I'm really provoked by the idea of social media. What can we do? Um, perhaps it's an unfortunate phrase, flash mobs, but uh, is there a way to really do innovation around social media? And at some level, to open it all the way up, I, I think we need a new religion. Uh, and the religion is around the uh, restraint around these technologies. As, as uh, my good friend and friend of all of ours, um, Stuart Brands once said, if we have become as gods, we had better get good at it. Well, maybe we need a new god. That is uh, really interesting, and certainly we're going to need to come back and hear a little bit more about that. Um, but let's keep going around the circle. And so, Greg, since um, Paul alluded to sensors, and you did too in your introduction, um, tell us what you think is most interesting. And, and also, uh, you know, you talked about the Internet of Things, and I think we should assume that not everybody watching this or listening really necessarily understands what you mean by that. So uh, help us out. Yeah, sure. Um, well, you know, we, uh, the industrial world, there's a lot of infrastructure, right? So we, you know, we depend on power generation systems. We depend on, you know, uh, water supplies coming to our house. We depend on, you know, getting from point A to point B via aircraft. Uh, we have all of these pieces of industrial equipment, and historically they've been separate from the Internet. Um, but that's not going to be the case. These um, uh, machines and devices are going to become connected uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, they'll be done, hopefully, in a secure way. Um, and, uh, and part of that has to do with just advent of sensor technologies, big data, being able to sort of find patterns and in information. Part of it has to do with the fact that we're, you know, our systems need to be more resilient. Uh, the infrastructure that we have has to support more use. It has to give uh, better outcomes for people on the planet. And the only way to do that is actually to, to you know, up their utilization, to get them to perform more broadly for the needs that we have. And so what's going to happen is that um, the things that we sort of count on are going to become more and more connected. Uh, we're going to have algorithms and machine learning that are going to start to uh, understand how to optimize those systems. And we're going to have to sort of start making decisions, and, and, and we will have platforms or infrastructure that will allow us to uh, connect things which may not have been connected before, or at least observe patterns between different types of data sets that we couldn't before. And I think one of the things that's going to be very interesting about that particular space is, uh, you know, what are we going to learn about um, our behaviors? Um, what are we going to learn about uh, how we operate the systems that we have? Uh, how are we going to utilize those to, uh, you know, bring a better standard of living to, uh, you know, the, the planet as a whole, and at the same time sort of deal with the resource constraints that we know we have. So um, the Internet of Things for consumers is a lot around you know, connected devices in the home. The Internet of Things that I'm interested in is really around, you know, sensor networks and um, getting infrastructure to do things that we need so that humanity can progress. Uh, so that's great, Greg. And I, uh, so I just want to say we've, we've heard about sensors so far. We've heard about the interconnectedness potentially of all things, big data sets, the possibility of pattern recognition in, in really important ways. And I'm reminded, Greg, of something that the Pope has said recently about this issue, which is that if we really want peace and security in the world, we need to eradicate poverty. And I think where you're beginning to point out is the connection between the social fiber globally and the role of technology. Uh, and we'll want to come back to that. Uh, but let's keep going. Um, and uh, Reese, um, help us understand what's going on in artificial intelligence. Um, well, a, a couple of big scale changes is about 70 years ago, uh, we entered into uh, a new era with the uh, first atomic bomb being um, detonated. And for the first time, humans were able to affect everything on Earth uh, in an instant. Um, and that's all sort of entered into a new era that some people call the Anthropocene, which is um, uh, an era where humans are, are affecting the Earth. 
And one of the uh, technologies that has emerged out of that is, is computers and the internet covering every uh, part of the earth and uh, now billions of people being attached by phones to the internet. And the internet remembers things and uh, uh, collects data in a memory like humans. And the processing power of computers uh, can appear to be intelligent in that using that memory to uh, figure out the right next thing to do or figure out uh, things like the forecast of the weather. And some of these things might be considered artificial intelligence or uh, smart processing of historical data. But uh, um, the Internet is becoming smarter and alive, and uh, that's affecting uh, the globally. And uh, among the things that's affecting is, is uh, uh, these kinds of weapons and, and uh, uh, global threats that uh, could potentially extinct us. So it's a new kind of consciousness, as Paul was mentioning, um, sort of a global consciousness, which is a combination of people and Internet um, that uh, uh, is uh, available to address these sort of problems. So um, it seems like a natural next step to go back to Bree. And Bree, you asked the question about why would we bring a neuroscientist in this conversation. I think it's probably obvious to anybody watching why we would do that. And what you say about the sitting at the intersection between biology and cognition, and as we think about artificial intelligence, really curious to know what you think we should be paying attention to over the next 10 years uh, around technology. Yeah. I. Well, I'm going to answer your question not about technology, but about science. So I okay. think there's some really interesting stuff going on in science right now at the intersection of neuroscience and psychology especially. Um, just in the last few years, we've seen some really interesting new data about moral decision making, for example. Now, okay, why is moral decision making relevant? It's relevant in part because we have a handful of people who are our gatekeepers um, in terms of our major nuclear weapon stores we're not it's not a lot of people and what those people do um, both with will and you know kind of uh, under a subconscious influence really really matters so understanding what plays into moral decision making what plays into cheating um, and what kind of incentives impact behavior I think is really important um, let me just give you a quick example. So um, I think many of us probably heard about some of the nuclear cheating scandals um, in both the Air Force and the Navy within the last two years. This is a really big deal. Um, you know, if we can't depend on people with top security clearance in our military to do things by the book um, in the United States, what can we expect from everyone else in the world? So I think those two scandals give us an opportunity to step back and say, what are we learning? Not what do we intuit, not what do we believe, what do we want to be true about moral decision making, but what do we actually know? Um, I was struck by a quote I dug up from um, one of the guys who was the author of uh, a report from the Air Force Research Institute. This is Adam Lothar. He said while the cheating was bad in the Air Force scandal, the cheating in the classroom was never going to put the actual weapons at risk. I think this is dead wrong. Um, and part of the reason for that is some of what we're seeing coming out of studies by people like Dan Ariely that show that cheating is really contagious. Um, that people, even who don't have any intent to cheat, um, find themselves more willing to cheat, even on little things, when cheating is part of the culture. Um, one of the most interesting things I saw in some of Ariely's work was that cheating is most contagious when it's driven by confusion rather than when it's driven by intent. So when you see somebody who's acting in a way that makes it clear that they're not quite playing by the rules, but it's not clear that they're choosing to not play by the rules, they just look confused, that's when you have the most cheating. So, you know, our, our leadership um, and our people who are our gatekeepers, they need to be absolutely up on some of the latest science, psychology, neuroscience, um, about this kind of moral decision making, the social influences on decision making. I think no matter what technology we have in place, if we don't have our best human decision making at work, we're going to fail. So I'll leave it there. Well, that could not be more helpful, to put all of this conversation about technology into a social, hum uh, human, and moral frame. 
And I'm reminded of things we've heard Eric Schlosser say recently about these very issues um, around our command and control structure, which go to exactly the kinds of things you're talking about, Bree. Um, so with that, let's look at big data. And um, I know we have Sean, uh, who has looked at big data around insurgencies and uh, has applied all of his work on big data in some really interesting ways in this space. So, Sean, when I ask you what we should be paying attention to you, what do you have to say? Um, look, I, I think there's a few things, right? Look, we, we, when we were in the nuclear age where they were controlled by a few state actors, um, you know, we had to come up with game theory, and that was a, a mathematical framework that we, uh, we didn't have or we didn't really have a necessity for. And we came up with that and actually allowed us to navigate um, through that space. As we move from the nuclear weapons moving out of state actors, we need a new kind of mathematics um, to help us understand um, that world where it's not just necessarily five people or five groups of people um, with access to that, but there could be you know, potentially hundreds. And that, that, you know, at that point, game theory doesn't really work as well as it does in the initial state. Um, what I would kind of frame that with is um, the, some of the issues with state actors was there was an escalation. There was a feed-forward loop. You, you attack me, I attack you, and then game theory kind of spoke very well to that. As soon as you have non-state actors that aren't necessarily holding pieces of land, the feed-forward loop isn't quite as um, dangerous. Um, so, you know, I, I don't, I'm a terrorist group and I set off um, some form of nuclear weapon. Where, where are you going to attack me? And, and I think that, that perhaps puts a little bit of break on this. What I would also say is it's much more likely to be some variant of a nuclear weapon, more like a dirty bomb. And at that point, you're sort of saying, well, is it going to kill more people than other, other types of weapons that we've got around? So is it really going to be the weapon of choice for terrorists? So I think both of those really need to be kind of addressed. Um, as well as, you know, pushing forward the mathematical framework that will give us the ability to navigate this much like game theory gave us this before. Wow, okay, so there is so much to dive into there. I'm really anxious to go there, um, and we will in just a moment, Sean. I'm going to come back to you when we want to dive deeply into a couple of specific sections. So before we go there, though, I want to hear from a couple more folks. And so John Perry Barlow, you started talking in your introduction about some of the conversations you have been part of historically uh, around this issue. So now as we ask you to think, as I know you're uh, very good at doing, as we ask you to think about the future of technology, given everything we've been hearing so far, what do you think we ought to be paying attention to? Well, I, unfortunately, I think that we, we still need to be paying more attention to the past uh, because Leviathan lumbers on. Uh, I mean, I, I had this rosy period of thinking that you know, I didn't have to worry about nuclear weapons anymore, and then I was doing some consulting for the Navy uh, about five years ago, I guess. And uh, I found myself speaking to the guy who was in charge of all the submarines. And I, I said, uh, what did you do with all those Trident subs? And he said, oh, I still have them. And uh, I said, uh, <laughs> what do you do with the tubes? He said, oh, they have missiles in them. And I said, well, where are they aimed? He said, well, they can, they're aimed at the center of the Pacific, but they could be retargeted very quickly. And, and I, I started to find out more about what was going on with the Trident system. I, I asked him at one point, I said, why don't you take them apart? And he said, look, right now I know where all that plutonium is. If we start decommissioning those weapons, nobody knows where it is which was a better answer than I expected, but not a very good one. And, and the reality is that the Trident missile system is contracted with Lockheed through 2043. They have a, they have a lock contract. Uh, and there are 5,000 warheads that are in a state of immediate readiness in the world. They're all, they're all being kept up to date by various military industrial complexes. Uh, and I think that, you know, they're also being kept, the systems that control them are not being kept up to date. The command and control systems are, you know, in some cases genuinely mid-60s technology still, still uh, in effect. And the possibility of something going bad there, I think, is, is really quite real and, and needs to be addressed. Okay? So there's, there's the, the Leviathan. Uh, then there's the... I believe that there, there's an argument that can still be made that nation states are safer if they have 
a Ferrari in the garage uh, than if they don't. Uh, I think there, there is something about feeling that sense of security that makes you a less irrational actor, and that we could we can argue at some length about that. Uh, finally, the the the, the lone uh, nuke-bearing terrorist. Uh, I think that is that is a, a, a real possibility, but it's not one of those things that I think we ought to really spend a great deal of, of, of time worrying about, it, as long as we're very careful about keeping track of where all of our uh, fissile materials are. I mean, that's where the focus needs to be. So thanks for that. I think it's so interesting that in this conversation about the future of technology that we are coming back to, importantly, the connection between technology, what we're, we're capable of doing, and how we will do it as human beings, and the fallibility and idiosyncrasies of human beings, and the even the class structure that we seem to have um, accepted globally uh, about uh, the nuclear states. Um, so that's all really interesting, and I wonder, um, Bruce. I should think you've got you're thinking a lot uh, uh, as somebody who looks at at risk and looks at threat across issue spaces. As you listen to this conversation, what's on your mind? Yeah, thanks, Erica, and, uh, and thanks to everybody that's involved in this in this um, this exercise. It's a really interesting conversation. Um, yeah, it is interesting to me. As Erica mentioned at the beginning, I was in the Foreign Service before, the State Department so sort of came into this issue from a, from a policy perspective, which is about as far away from technology as, as one could probably get. Uh, the State Department is uh, not generally regarded as one of the most technologically advanced um, agencies in the U.S. government, and certainly wasn't in the, in the 80s and 90s when I was there. But you know, at the Global Threats Fund, we work on a handful of global, of a big collective action, collective impact problems like climate change, like water, like pandemics, and you know, looking looking at those issues, I think all of those sectors have done a much better job at incorporating some of the the, the technology pieces, the di distributed you know distributed uh, connectivity. You know, even even absorbing the, the um, sort of the, the psychology elements that have been, have been talked about on this call as well, and neuroscience, really understanding how people engage around an issue, um, and then using technology to make that um, engagement more impactful. Um, this space just hasn't really done that very well, you know, and I think that's part of why we and 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 the other funding partners that we're working, you know, that I, that we're working with at, at school have been interested in N Square and interested in having this conversation about how do you use new technology, how do you use co connectivity, how do you use distributed everything um, to get new thinking into this arena. So, um, you know, I think it's it's an exciting kickoff to this conversation, and uh, you know, I'm I'm already getting some uh, some ideas on this um, uh, from the from the chat so far. So, let's keep it moving. That's great, and um, as I think we said in the framing of this whole conversation, we'll come back to this at the end, when we say we're getting ideas, you know, obviously we're interested in ideas that we could eventually make small investments in, small bets on, so I know Bruce and I are both listening uh, for those kinds of ideas as well. Uh, so let me shift the frame a little bit, and let me see if this is a helpful way to start the next part of our conversation. The nuclear weapons era is 70 years old. Uh, I think we could all agree that a, a way to uh, describe the timeline here is that the nuclear weapons era really began in earnest when we dropped the bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, I'm sure historians of the field would argue with that start date, but let's just go with it for today. Uh, this is the 70th anniversary uh, of those events, 2015. And uh, as somebody who's relatively new to this field, uh, in all of the many conversations I've had in the last few months, the consensus seems to be that the very best case scenario, if we were to get to multilateral disarmament, it would probably take us 20 to 30 years to get there. Uh, so if we accept that framing, uh, my question about technology is, what is going to be happening in technology alongside this next chapter and maybe closing chapter, one might hope, uh, in the nuclear weapons era. Uh, what, how will the interplay look between technology and this next chapter? 
So I'm asking you all now to think about the next 20 or 30 years. I realize in some cases uh, that will be, be easy and others of you will want to focus on maybe a, a nearer term horizon, say the next decade. Uh, but to the extent that you can, help us think about the longer view. Uh, and Reese, I'd like to start with you. Well, uh, things are changing from a technology point of view at an exponential pace with uh, things like phones and camera phones getting twice as good every year, year over year. And a 20 to 30 year time frame is, is billions of times more powerful with, uh, for example, billions of times more cameras monitoring uh, everything um, from satellite imagery to Google Earth to uh, surveillance to uh, or, um, general citizens with their phones going on about. So the ability to uh, know what's going on everywhere in the world uh, with billions of people watching for it that with maybe a social culture of if you see something, say something, the technology to uh, know what's happening, uh, whether it be dirty bombs or facilities as monitored uh, from afar, uh, that technical capability is uh, becoming extraordinarily powerful very rapidly. And 30 years from now, it will be virtually impossible to hide anything. That's great. So uh, living life out loud, really, globally, is what uh, that sounds like. I, just before we go to anybody else to, to take us in a different direction, I wonder if anybody wants to comment on what Reese just proposed to us. Uh, billions of times more powerful. Uh, really nothing uh, hiding under any rocks over the next 20 to 30 years. What, what well, is it? You want to jump yeah. in there? Go ahead, Greg. This is Greg Petrov. Um, yeah, I would suggest that, um, you know, to, to build on that, you know, sensor networks are just going to be everywhere. And uh, the cost of sensors are dramatically dropping. The intelligence of sensors at the edge, the ability for sensors to um, aggregate and do compute at the edge um, you know, without human intervention. Um, those types of things I think are probably very interesting in the sort of verification side because I imagine if there's a disarmament component to this, um, you know, there'll be a need to sort of track what happens to things as they are, you know, um, uh, deconstructed. Um, and so I think that'll be an important part of it. But um, to build on the other part, the data streams that come off of these sensor networks, many of these data streams are going to become publicly available or they will have um, uh, analogous data sets that will mimic with relative degree of certainty the, app, the real data set, meaning that you can derive data from other sources of data to discern patterns that you may not have access to all of the information. Uh, and there are going to be a lot of uh, opportunities for uh, citizens to, or, or, or you know, the general public, or nonprofit organizations to build applications that are analyzing streams of data for patterns. Uh, in ways that make sense for them uh, to track them, whatever their interests are. And so I think um, there will be the capability for, you know, sensing networks and for um, uh, ways for conversations to sort of uh, rise to the top that we really haven't seen before. And it, I don't know what it's going to look like, but um, we are certainly going to be able, we're going to be in an environment where um, there will be a, a massive amount of transparency about what's going on. and, and that's not necessarily a good thing because transparency can actually add volatility to uh, environments. Um, if you know everything that's going on uh, and someone acts in a certain particular way, um, you know, markets and uh, events can react even faster. So I think you know, we'll have to, in the, in the case of actually having more information, that's great, but we're also going to have to deliver some ways to sort of have pause and, and not necessarily act uh, immediately on what we learn. So those are kind of the, th the spaces I think are interesting. So, hey, John Perry Barlow, I think you wanted to jump in with a with a quickly, I mean, I, you know, there's an assumption that we're all making here, it seems, that big data analysis works and will go on working better. Uh, I don't, I don't find much evidence to support that. Actually, I mean, uh, you know, whether it's looking at the silly stuff that Facebook is advertising to me, when it should be much better at this. Uh, or at the fact that the intelligence agencies uh, didn't even see uh, ISIS coming in rather large manifestation until it was already at the door. Uh, 
I mean, I, I don't think that we're much better at this. Uh, the most terrifying moment in, in my career of, of opposing nuclear weapons was when Cheney told me that I didn't have to worry about the MX basing system anymore because they were going to put them in Minuteman silos and put them on launch on warning. And I think what we're talking about is something like launch on warning, that you know we, we trust our machines more than we trust our own judgment. And I don't trust our machines uh, anymore. Just, just because there are more of them doesn't mean that they're any smarter. So hey, um, John, you've started a, you've started a um, series of uh, reactions here, which is good. So um, Sean, I know you have something you want to say, and Bree, so jump on in. <clears throat> yeah, look, um, I, I think we should be um, absolutely um, cautious as to what our big data can and can't do. Um, but with the same token, we have to be absolutely um, as cautious about what the human brain can and can't do. So it's not going to be a case, I think, of, of throwing this off to some AI-type machine that will decide um, you know, where all the nukes are, are they in danger, should they be launched, what's the threat level, any more than it should be kind of you know, the same way towards a, a human doing that same process. So I think you know, what we're going to want to do is really start thinking about the interfaces between um, both the AIs that we create and also the human decision makers um, that are around. So it's definitely not an either-or situation. And, you know, I'd also sort of underscore this and say, you know, we're maybe five years into the era of big data. And this is very, very um, early in that space. And what we're going to have at our disposal in the next 20 years is going to be pretty, um, uh, I think, pretty advanced compared to where we are today. So, Bree, uh, you had a comment on this strand. And then, um, uh, Reese, uh, I think you have an interesting um, example to share about sensors and big data getting better. So uh, let's go to Bree, and then we'll go to Reese. Yeah, I think I also have um, some skepticism that big data, as, it see, as its trajectory is pointing it today, is going to be that helpful here. And the reason for that is I think big data is really great when you have lots of it. Um, that's um, kind of a pun, I guess. Um, you need networks that can learn. You need enough data to be able to see patterns that are normal and deviations from those patterns. So if you want to pick up what's going on with the, the flu as it spreads across the globe, big data is great for that. You want to see something catching on that's viral, an idea, a meme that's being shared, fantastic. You want to pick up a single instance of a person deviating from a nuclear security protocol, I think that's going to be a lot tougher. And I think that if we want to depend on data and sensors to do that, we're going to have to design them to do that. Um, and so we need to get really thoughtful about what exactly we want to sense because I think behavior and deviations from nuclear protocol are not things that are going to naturally come out of new patterns in big data the way that some other phenomena are going to. So if I look back in the biological world, I just said that I think flu is an example where big data is really useful. Um, I think the nuclear threat is a little closer to something like a fundamentally new disease that we've never seen before popping up, or the first instance of, of SARS or a SARS-like virus. It's not even like Ebola. What it requires is really careful monitoring, rapid reporting, and transparency, sharing of data. Um, I think I would put more faith in that than I would on great patterns of sensors and data that's already being developed for other purposes, giving us really terrific new data about nuclear security. But if anybody else has a different idea on that, I'd love to hear it. Okay, so um, I want to tee this up and ask both Reese to comment, and uh, you had an example to share, but you also have, um, so obviously, perspectives on the next 30 years of artificial intelligence, I'm sure. And then, um, Paul Sappo, I want to come back to you in just a minute, check in with you as the anchor here, and, and make sure we're picking your brain about what's, uh, what's emerging from this conversation. So, Reese. Well, from a sensor point of view, uh, the sensors are actually people uh, who are smart uh, in a human sort of way, and they can report things back to the general social networks. Um, and just as we've seen uh, social networks overthrow sort of repressive uh, governments, um, the same uh, trust can be put in uh, groups of people uh, helping policing in a way and by creating things like streetlights, it reduced uh, the crime and improved the safety of, of uh, neighborhoods 
And by putting sensors in everybody's hands and making it easy for people to report things, it's sort of like putting lights on information everywhere in the world. So uh, I'm not as pessimistic about the ability of the Internet and phones and big data in the hands of people to uh, spread information widely of people, of, of bad actors acting in aberrant ways, like, even down to dirty bombs and, and not just uh, nuclear weapons in the classical sense. So what do, you, uh, what do you have to say about that, Paul? Well, I'm, I'm actually very heartened by the direction this conversation is, is taking. Um, as I listen to the sense of it, it feels like well, each age has a new hidden risk. And it feels like the hidden risk here is the tension between imperfect humans and imperfect but ever more autonomous machines. And we all know of instances of scary situations of humans in the loop uh, making things worse and then situations where humans try to get into the loop and can't. And, and just as an analogy, I, I think back to Air France 447, which in June 2009 crashed in the middle of the Atlantic. And it's a story that I, I don't think people really think about what happened there. That plane was flying itself. Most people don't realize that um, when they're in airplanes, they, they worry about someday planes not having pilots. It's already true. A, a plane flying at altitude uh, like a, a 340 or a 777 isn't being flown by the pilot at all. And that plane, it, uh, it was about eight minutes after 2 a.m. that the autopilot said, we have a problem. And that plane hit the water at uh, 14 minutes after 2 at 107 knots. The pilots finally figured out what was wrong. They figured it out uh, 20 seconds before they crashed, too late to do anything. And it was a problem of interface design. And so I, I think that if I, what I get from the conversation here is there, there is not a technology deus ex machina, but there, that we really have to pay attention to this interface between the machines and, and humans. And I, I find that heartening because that's a very solvable problem. Wow, there's a lot to say about that. Uh, Sean, I know you uh, feel similarly that there was an interface problem there about the, the, the design aspects of human beings interacting with intelligence from sensors. And I wonder if you want to expand on this any right now, Sean, or do you want to wait a little bit? Or <clears throat> Yeah, look, I, I think one of the things we should really um, think about is We've got to effectively monitor now a, a globe um, between uh, humans and um, AI systems. And over the next 30 years, we're going to have to increasingly um, monitor a, a more complex globe. So what, what jobs do we leave to humans? What jobs do we leave to machines? And what jobs do we interface? Um, and ha who's designing those interfaces? And what are some of the, uh, the problems that we get from those interfaces? So I think, um, you know, the other piece is, we, we should also remember um, air traffic, you know, massively safer thanks to AI systems um, driving effectively driving planes. Um, should we expect the same thing for AI systems driving nuclear weapons and nuclear weapon decisions, or should we expect the opposite? Um, I don't think we know, but um, it's something we should do a lot of thinking about. So there's uh, something in here about the, the uh, quantity and type of, of sensor systems that are going to be interacting with each other in the future. Uh, it sounds increasingly in the future. Uh, Greg, I wonder if you can comment on that, and then um, I'm going to steer us in a different direction for just a moment. Sure. Um, I mean, uh, look, we are entering a space where uh, the juxtaposition of different data sets often allows us to find insights. and. Uh, many of those data sets are publicly held data sets, um, and you know the, and some won't be right. So I, I can imagine in this space, you know, many of these data sets are closely held secrets by different governments, and and we won't be able to have access to them. But um, there are always other ways to collect corollary data, um, and smart people, uh, when they look at a problem, will find ways to you know build. Um, uh, uh, a corollary, so you know something, some form of indicator of a particular action or event. 
And I think that uh, where we're, the, the thing that's interesting about where we're headed into is the ability to connect these different kinds of sets of information uh, and sort of script uh, those to analytics and AI capabilities are, are, are it, it's an art form that's emerging. And it may be one of the areas where, you know, an environment like this invests some attention to because you, you may be able to discern um, leading indicators. And, and to the example of a, uh, you know, the stars example that was given earlier, um, you know, is, is, you know, is it, what's the impact of that, right? And, and finding the anomaly may be one thing, but understanding does that actually have meaning? Is it meaningful? Uh, is another, and I think we are getting to a point where we're starting to be able to predictively connect um, that meaning to something that we even don't have, we don't have domain expertise to, and I think that's one of the areas that's very exciting around uh, the AI and analytics space that's going on right now in industry. And uh, So there's uh, probably some parts of the puzzle that could be helped there. I don't think, you know, sensor networks are going to do the whole thing, but that juxtaposition of data, I think, uh, and the transparency of it is going to change our world in a lot of ways that we don't understand yet. And I think the problem right there is, you know, what is agency? What is the information that we need to have communi uh, communicated to decision makers? And, and how do we do it in a way where they can make good decisions? Uh, and, and, and that balance between uh, AI versus human beings making those decisions in this arena is going to be one that obviously is going to have to, a lot of attention is going to have to be paid to. So, uh, Bree, I'm going to turn to you for a last question or set of observations on this, and then I'm going to I'm going to move us all to focus. You'll recall that in the beginning of this section, I said we're looking at this next chapter of the interplay between technology and the the nuclear enterprise. Um, so, I'm going to shift us in a minute to talk specifically about nuclear technologies. Um, and so get ready for that. Uh, but first, Bree, I want to come back to you to, to kind of put a um, final button on this. I know you had some thoughts. Yeah, I really like Sean's comments on um, asking about the question about what machines should be responsible for, what should humans be responsible for, and where does that interaction sit. Um, I also kind of want to connect that back to a, uh, a topic that came up a little bit earlier, uh, maybe even before we got started, about how this generation of people who are coming up now, um, they don't have the same experience um, of the people who were in our first era that Paul named of nuclear proliferation. People who saw or read about or understood Hiroshima, um, what nuclear weapons, what power they actually have. I grew up in an era when, you know, I, as a kid I was watching threads and um, the day after tomorrow. Was it the day after tomorrow? I can't remember the name of the movie. But we had all these movies. We had fiction um, about what the what nuclear a uh, nuclear holocaust could look like. And I bring all of this up as a way of saying one of the things that machines can't do right now is empathize. And um, when we're talking about moral decision making that gets out of the realm of utilitarianism and analysis and into the realm of what is right and good for humanity. Um, our inability to be able to visualize what the impacts of nuclear weapon use look like could be really devastating. Um, there are really interesting studies on this that show that people use more emotional resources than analytical resources when they can visualize the outcome in a moral decision. And I think that as we're looking in the next several decades and we're thinking about the people who are kind of going to be in charge, we have to be very concerned about what their capacity to visualize and imagine is going to look like, and we have to be thinking about how do we grab the capacity, the special capacity of humans to empathize and use empathy in moral decision making. How do we use that in a way that intersects with the data and the analysis and the sensors in the optimal way? So let me build on that, uh, Brie, because I think you've created a perfect segue now to, to come back to the question of uh, what's actually going to be happening in this sector. Um, and that is uh, something like this. Um, we now have more scientific evidence than we have ever had about the long-term consequences of the use of nuclear weapons and even the testing of nuclear weapons in both planetary and humanitarian terms. We're also at a moment where as people think about their own futures over the next 10, 20, 30 years, there are an enormous number of things to be worried about. And as Paul reminds us, uh, I'm going to ask you to talk about this in a moment, Paul, what we're focused on here 
is a low probability but high consequence uh, idea. It's really for most of us just an idea that we can barely make ourselves think about as we worry about all sorts of other things over the course of our daily lives. So um, that has everything to do with decision making, uh, moral judgment, um, just how we feel in the world, where is the sense of agency and so forth. So now as we shift into specifically thinking about what's going on in the nuclear sector over these next couple of decades, Paul, I wonder if you could help us make that bridge between where we've just been and, and where we're going. Well, I think Bree queued it up very nicely. Uh, again, it comes back to human behavior. Um, we're, we have all sorts of challenges in modern society, um, but a special challenge are events that are low probability but really high consequence. It's uh, sort of the difference, uh, think about the difference between flying in an airplane and driving in your car. If your car breaks down, you slow off to the side of the road and you call the tow truck service. If the plane breaks down in midair, it has a rather different result. Uh, and luckily for us, we've designed planes so they don't break down as often as our cars. Uh, of course, we still have a ways to go in terms of making our computers as reliable as our cars. Um, I think a lot of challenges these days are finding how to smooth that curve out between the infrequent but really high consequence event and the frequent but low consequence events. This has come up a couple of times. I think it comes back that the, the most promising technology space, in, in my opinion, is really deeply understanding the, the interface between uh, our humans and our tech. Um, if we're going to avoid surprises, I suspect that's the most productive area to tackle. Uh, okay, that's helpful. There are Reese, in a minute I want to come to you to talk about, uh, to follow up on some of the things that Paul just said, but Sean, I want to, I want to come to you because I know you have been thinking a lot specifically about what's going on in nuclear and what will be going on in nuclear in the uh, medium and long-range future. So can you jump in there and then Reese, I'm going to come to you. Yeah, look, um, I, I think one of the things we, we want to frame this as um, there, as a physicist, there are, there are a few fundamental forces in the universe, and, and we know um, nuclear is one of them. Um, another one is electromagnetism, and another one is gravity. And we sort of rewind the clock back um, perhaps 150 years, and uh, humans uh, had very little grasp of any of these fundamental forces. Um, we started to get very good at um, understanding electromagnetism and, and indeed manipulating electromagnetism. We got so good to the effect um, we, we can actually replicate human intelligence through the manipulation of this fundamental force. About 50 years after we started getting you know, good at this, we started to um, break apart the nuclear force and understand what was going on there. Now this, as we should remember, required a huge investment um, through the Manhattan Project to really pull apart and understand the dynamics of the nuclear force. From this, um, we got a crude understanding. Um, from that crude understanding of a, a very, very powerful force, we were able to create um, weapons and um, then later on, um, effectively using um, this much like a steam engine, we were able to create nuclear uh, power plants. But we're very, very primitive in our use of this force. Um, and you know, if we kind of jump forward to gravity, we've got no real understanding of that force um, at all. So I, I think for me over the next 30 or 40 years, one of the fundamental questions is how much better are we going to get at manipulating the fundamental force of nuclear um, interaction? And that could go um, over 40 years, that could take us from where we were with electromagnetism at the start of the, uh, the 20th century through to uh, you know, 1950 where we got pretty damn good at it. Or it could take us nowhere. And I, I think as a human species, the, the real question is, how deep are we going to dive into understanding nuclear forces? And you know, part of that is going to be driven, I think, by nuclear weapons. The other part of it is going to be driven by nuclear power. And if we look at nuclear power, is going to be, is that going to be a bet that we make um, in going into the next generation of power stations, or are we going to, you know, really decide that um, photovoltaics are going to give us most of the needs, and we're going to pull back um, from nuclear power? So I think for me, addressing that question. Um, is, is I think going to be pretty instrumental when we think about nuclear weapons in the next um, 50 years. So John Perry Barlow, you have a thought about all that. 
one of one of my big concerns that, that the thing that I've devoted the balance of my life to is climate change, which I I really do believe in, uh, and I I do not think that we're going to get up enough solar cells or or uh, uh, wind generators or or all those sustainable and dear to the Californian heart methods of addressing the energy problem. I think we're going to have to go to nuclear. Uh, and, and at the same, you know, I, I think that there is a positive aspect to that in, in this regard. We had 68,000 active weapons in 1985, and we've only got five or 6,000 now. Uh, most of those were turned into material to be used in nuclear power plants. And new nukes are very different from the old nukes, and we have, uh, we have means of making new nukes, and I, and I, uh, I think this was uh, some of what was just uh, alluded to. We have, we have new methods of understanding the use of nuclear energy that would make it, I think, uh, very practical for us to reconfigure all of that fissile material into energy for the planet at a time when we really need it quickly. Uh, and I, I would hope that we would at least give that some consideration uh, because there is a lot of energy there stored and the same organizations that are, are holding these missiles still ready and at bay could be, I think, reconfigured to taking them apart and, and, and putting them into, uh, into an energy producing format. So you had, you had something for the military industrial complex to be doing uh, since we don't know how to defund it. Hmm. So there's a little bit of a buzz going on behind the scenes here and so I, I want to uh, hear what Paul and uh, Greg have to say about uh, another point of risk in this equation. Greg, why don't you go first? Yeah, I would just say that you know I, I don't know much about the, the, the systems that are in place but my guess is that um, you know the SCADA systems, the the um, control systems that are used to uh, manage these devices are operating on 50s or 60s era technology. Um, you know, it's actually pretty sound technology, pretty well designed. Um, but there's sort of two, uh, two. There's a good and a bad side to it. The good side is because of the era and the way it was created, most of them being mechanical based systems, it's pretty hard to hack them. Um, and get into them to do anything. Um, but the downside is that the expertise in how these systems work and, and, and how to keep them upgraded and how to manage them is retiring or has retired already. So, um, you know, there's a whole side to this space where um, around the control systems for uh, this kind of stuff that we probably should be worried about. Yeah, I, and uh, I second what you're saying on the... the SCADA systems, uh, it, it's a little bit like Ted Nelson's famous quip uh, rephrasing Lord Acton of a hundred years earlier that all power corrupts and obsolete power corrupts obsoletely. Uh, just <laughs> the fact that it's so hard to get into them is a plus. Uh, uh, John, I push back at you a little bit on solar. Uh, of course, Stuart Brand and, and others uh, agree with you that nuclear power is inevitable, um, but I think we're underestimating how quickly solar uh, photovoltaics will will advance. Uh, solar cell is just a big chip and chips are governed by Moore's law. And to me the most intriguing part about that technology is it pushes us towards a decentralized uh, power system and, and, and forces the utilities to go to smart grids and picking up on what Greg was talking about earlier, I think that's an opportunity to make this system a lot more resilient. And, you know, uh, while we worry about uh, nuclear terrorism, it would also be nice if our power system was more like our automobiles that failed gracefully instead of suddenly. And it feels to me that that technology is, is moving very quickly. And um, it could be architected in a way that it helps uh, tackle part of the nuclear challenge. So, Reese, 
Uh, give us a little perspective from where you sit about, uh, you know, we've covered a lot of territory just in the last two or three minutes. Um, we've been talking about areas of risk. We've been talking about decaying infrastructure. We've been talking about the potential for hacking. Um, so I want to come back to you and see where you are now as you listen to all this discussion. Well, I'm somewhere between Paul and John Perry uh, in terms of the power issue. Uh, the, the nuclear uh, uh, reactors can be small and distributed and uh, independent in a smart grid, uh, just like solar. Uh, the Navy has proved that this uh, works uh, worldwide with ships and submarines, and NASA's proved this, this works for satellites as well. So a mix of uh, nuclear and solar is what we have now, and uh, it's uh, the fear around nuclear power pushed a lot of people uh, into using fossil fuels for energy, which has, uh, by some arguments, caused the global warming problem. So some of the tech, uh, things around nuclear power are driven by fear and not science, and driven by uh, fear and not evidence. And so there's there's a middle ground in terms of both uh, nuclear for power and, and nuclear risk. Um, but among the risks of, of nuclear weapons being in the control of governments who know where they are, uh, there are a large number, last number I heard is 17,000 uh, active nuclear weapons in the world. And uh, among those are um, uh, the Soviet Union produced over 100 briefcase size nuclear weapons um, that uh, to take out uh, bridges or cities or infrastructure and uh, uh, approximately 50 of those are unknown where they are at present. So any one of those could turn up in Manhattan at any point and be detonated not by a, uh, uh, you know, a state actor but by a, a, a rogue individual. And, and that's not including uh, dirty bombs, which is just taking radioactive material and putting in a conventional explosive and contaminating uh, an area so these kind of things are, are people problems in that, uh, like, uh, just like uh, guns and, and bullets don't kill people, it's the shooter that kills the people. And the same sort of analogy might be applied to nuclear power, nuclear weapons. It's how these things are handled and not uh, the technology itself. Of course, Risa, I understand <clears throat> rumor is that those 50 missing briefcase bombs are all running Windows 2000, so I think we're safe. So, um, okay, so here, you know, I'm, uh, I'm keeping track of the time here, although I'm, I, I hope I'm doing it well. I'm not sure I am. I know that Pete is helping me behind the scenes here. Um, and I want to make sure that we have a chance um, to do two things, uh, at least two things, before we finish up the session today. So one is we have a question from the audience. I want to go to that now. And then I also want to signal to all of you where we're going to go before we finish our conversation today, which is to ask some advice from all of you. Uh, as we said at the beginning, we have a, a little bit of money and a little bit of time. And so I, I would want to know if all of you, including those of you who are watching online, uh, if all of you were in a position to make some small investments on some technology bets over the next 10 years or so uh, that uh, will uh, change the game uh, around nuclear safety and security, non-proliferation, uh, where would you place those bets? So think about that. But before we go there, we have a question from the audience which has to do with whistleblowers and uh, the use of uh, sensors and uh, evolving social media. Uh, and whether or not these could improve the ability of, of the lay person, the uh, person in the public, the citizen, to report um, illicit proliferation activities or nuclear security lapses, uh, which we could imagine the trickiness of that at, uh, let's say, national labs or, for that matter, any other facilities around the world. So uh, what do you all have to say to the person in the audience asking that question? Uh, I'll, uh, I, I think they put their finger on a really important issue uh, and clearly since 9-11 we have been pushing ever deeper into a world where whistleblowers are ever more punished 
and it seems to be purely bipartisan process with each successive president trying to outdo the other in terms of this. So I, I would just say great flagging of an issue and it's, it's, it's also a multi-impact issue in that um, making life easier for whistleblowers could not only help in this problem space but in lots of others as well and, and it's a good example of, of why we need to focus on the human side. I suspect that there's a question behind this question, which is all of us, I think there may be, um, there, there are questions about whether all of us who are carrying around handheld devices could essentially become citizen monitors of nuclear activity. And there, there are obvious privacy issues associated with that. Uh, but just wonder if anybody wants to comment on the potential here. And uh, Paul, I notice you have something in your hand. Yeah, it's, it's funny you mention it. it this is a, a little radi pocket radiation detector, no well dressed geek goes out without one these days. Uh, I had to carry it for a project I worked on some years ago and it's small enough I just keep it in my bag all the time and it regularly goes off with false alarms which I ignore. So, but it's, it, this is, you know, sort of 2009 technology, you know, a couple hundred bucks and the size of a postage stamp. Uh, the, clearly the sensor technology is advancing small enough that you could embed this in lots of stuff. Uh, then there's a real open question whether that's a good idea or not uh, and would we have the the cry wolf effect but at least the technology is there to experiment with. Um, Greg, you, anything you want to comment on there since this is in your bailiwick? Uh, oh, no, I mean just to kind of echo what Paul is saying, the, uh, the cost of edge computing just continues to drop. You know, Intel uh, showed their Edison chip this year which is you know a full-sized uh, you know 486 class PC in the size of an SD card. Um, so um, we, we are at a point where um, sensor networks can be deployed uh, inexpensively and, and ubiquitously and it depends on how you use the data but um, that's the era, the world that we're moving into is if, if, it, if there's a stream of information that's useful coming off of something we will capture it and, uh, and it won't be very expensive for us to do it. Uh, by the way, th this thing is useful for one thing. Um, I, I don't know about you all, I'm old enough to remember when we carried pagers and I really miss my pager because in the age of pagers you could get out of meetings by quietly pushing on your pager and it would send off a signal in a few moments ago, oh darn, got to go catch this, it's an important call. And so I've always been tempted in a meeting to set this thing off and say, oh, sound, looks like a, uh, it, I'm detecting gamma radiation, maybe we should adjourn the meeting. <laughs> well, we're flattered that you haven't done that in this phone call, so, uh, or in this video conference. Um, so, okay, here we go. We're going we're gonna to wrap this up now in the next few minutes, and um, this is where I'm, I'm um, going to ask for help from everybody on the uh, Google Hangout here with us, both those people that I can see and those that I can't. Uh, if you were us, if you had uh, some funds to invest uh, coming up here based on all the things you've heard here today and for that matter anything that we haven't touched on in terms of potentially disruptive technologies related to nuclear safety, security, non-proliferation, where would you place your bets? Uh, Reese, I wonder if I could come to you first and then I'll come to you, John Perry Barlow, and we'll go around the circle and I'm going to end up with uh, the person who actually is in the funding community in this conversation along with me and that's Bruce, so I'll come to you last. But uh, let's go to you first, Reese. I'm wondering. Well, I think the policy thing is, is clearly uh, um, something that's been going on for a long time and, and is an effective way of dealing with the state actors who control a large portion of the nuclear weapons and the new technologies that are uh, coming along make possible uh, more widespread uh, observation and surveillance and whistleblowers was mentioned that uh, um, both the satellite and the phones uh, allow sort of citizen uh, watchdogs to be add, added to the uh, monitoring of, of what's happening not only with nuclear weapons but with the people who control them, uh, whether they be good or bad uh, governments or individuals. And so that's, that's a, a great sort of optimistic uh, 
possibility that um, the newer technologies will make things safer by having more people watching the safety. So, John Perry, how about you? Uh, I, I want to, I think, put my main emphasis on, on trying to change the politics around nuclear energy. Uh, I think people need to be made aware of the fact that there have been big changes in that technology. Uh, the little nukes, uh, the the nukes that that can't melt down, uh, and that kind of thing. Are, I think the best way to deal with all this fissile material is to get rid of it, uh, because we have a, a a higher use for it than it's presently being applied to, and 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 a sense of urgency about that use. I think that's that's one very very strong answer for for the problem. The other thing is, you know, I spend half my life protecting people like Ed Snowden, and uh, I do that because I, I believe that we have to have completely uh, transparent government. We have to convey the right to know to everybody so that we can all be part of the policy process. Uh, there are risks uh, inherent in that with regard to nuclear weapons. And there's no question about that being the, the scariest thing, is that people know uh, where they are and how to get them. But uh, I think it's more important to know what the governments and, and institutions are doing with regard to them. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna say again, Pete Leiden, Maybe you can help me keep track of this. If anybody out there in uh, who's watching right now has any advice for us, go ahead and let Pete and us know through the Google Chat feature. Um, but Bree, I'm gonna come to you, and then I'd like to hear from Greg. So I think in thinking about where we're heading in the next 30 years, I would focus on improving human systems. Um, I, it may just be that I know more about those, but I, I believe we're in a place right now where we're already seeing failures in a very secure, highly trained workforce. Um, you know, as we move into territory where there are ever more sources of nuclear material, there are non-state actors, um, there are cl less clear geopolitics, I think, Investing now in the human systems, both within our company, our own country, and internationally, is really critical. So I think that means things like um, looking to the way that companies are ensuring their own security by hiring hackers to try to tap into their systems and and expose vulnerabilities. Are we doing that with our nuclear systems? If not, we should be. Um, going through simulations, asking if X, Y, or Z happens, how do we respond? If you see data from your colleague that looks like they're doing something that is impermissible, or if this pops up on social media, what is our response? Even simulating if a dirty bomb were to go off, what do we what do we wish we would have known? Um, you know, are there things that we could start building into systems? I have no idea that this is doable, but certainly in anthrax, boy, isn't it great that we had a, a signature within anthrax that let us know what lab that came from? really helped in the investigation. Is there something that we could do with our nuclear material in terms of tagging, et cetera? But that's more of a technological question. My bigger issue is just we know a lot about how to make human systems better, um, how to make them more transparent, how to help them prepare for a wider range of eventualities, and I think that we've really underinvested in that area to date. Uh, thanks, Bree, for that. And I just note that we do have a response from somebody who's watching the episode uh, who points to a, a publication just that just came out on nukewatch.org, nukewatch.org, uh, about whistleblowing and monitoring. Uh, so I would point folks to that if you're interested in pursuing that strand. Uh, and so now we're coming around the loop here, and I'm going to go to you, Greg, and um, then I'm going to wind up with Sean and then Bruce, and then we're going to come back to Paul Sappho. So, Greg. Uh, so I would do something, I, I don't know if this would work or not, but um, I would um, assume that you could have access to all the data that you needed and all the sensor information networks that you could have access to. Um, and then I would um, invest a little bit of time designing um, a, 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 a system for um, making that information more transparent, uh, both publicly and, um, and for our stakeholders and, and, and environments, um, and and then hope that over time those would match, right? And and it's it's sort of you know one of the things that we're doing right now uh, in the work that I'm involved with 
sometimes we don't have the ability to understand what kinds of information we can get, but we certainly have, we know the questions we want to try to answer, and so we just assume we can get it, and then um, we go about designing a, a, an environment, uh, you know, an experience for people to make, make decisions with, and then that tends to help us with people who are out wrangling the data to know how to exercise or manage that data to make that work for us. So, in a way, it would be sort of storyboarding or building a concept car of of how you would track this kind of insight and information, uh, assuming that there weren't boundaries in the kinds of data that you would have access to, um, and then uh, and you and communicate that potentially as a, a blueprint for a direction that you might want to head. Great, that is uh, super helpful and very practical, and I appreciate that. Um, Right, so let's come right back around to Sean Gorley, and um, and then I'm going to come to you, Bruce Lowry, in just a moment. Um, so, Sean. Yeah, look, I think for me, if I had a little um, money to play with in this area, that um, I think would have a big impact. Um, what I would look is is trying to create technologies um, or trying to fund initiatives that can convert. Um, the uh, I guess the old spent materials from uh, nuclear power and uh, nuclear weapons and, and convert them into new and, and reusable um, technologies that can power new types of, of energy or I guess power energy from new types of processes. Um, I think that gets us um, a couple of things. One is it gets us um, more power relatively cheaply if we can do that but the second thing is it takes care of a lot of uh, uh, material that's currently sitting unused and uh, potentially can get into the hands of, of people we don't want it to get into. So you know the most, uh, the best thing we can do is to make that valuable, and you make that valuable by coming up with new technologies that can utilize it. So I'd like to see some of the money getting back into uh, fundamental research to uh, to create new ways of, of utilizing spent nuclear products. Sean, I think like uh, many of the things that have been said here today, that could itself be a full episode. We could just spend uh, easily 90 minutes just talking about those opportunities for new investment and opportunities for innovation. So that's, a, I think, a really terrific place for us to uh, put a page mark in. Um, and then step back for just a moment. I think we have just a few minutes left here. Um, and ask Bruce, who I'm sure has heard many conversations like this over the years, not just in the nuclear space, but across all, all Bruce, do you want to jump in? Oops, you're muted. Hey, a problem with the demo gods. Um, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Sorry, I think the system went down a little bit. Yeah, I, I you know, I did, this has been a really great conversation. Uh, it, to me, at least, one of the interesting sort of questions that, that arises is investment sort of directly yes. technologies like Sean has talked about, um, you know, nuclear nuclear technologies uh, to, to add um, some so different 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 direction. And think about interest. Versus, um, again, I can't tell if you, if you can hear me or not, Ver, versus sort of, um, you know, better application of existing technologies around data, around, uh, you know, distributed networks, around sensors, and then understanding where kind of philanthropic money can play a role. I mean, it, you know, we're unlikely to be able to do investment in new technologies that may be, you know, multi-million, hundred million dollar sort of propositions versus, you know, interesting applications of existing technologies in new ways, taking into account sort of the, the, the human, the human machine interface that people have talked a lot about today. So anyway, really interesting conversation, lots of, of, of threads to follow up on, so thank you all. Well, we certainly appreciate, Bruce, your contribution here, and we're unfortunately at the top of, or getting to the, the end of our session here, and so what we always do here at reInventors is we end up with uh, our anchor. A few closing thoughts, and we couldn't have a better person than then uh, Paul to actually maybe wind this up. Paul, do you want to pick it up from here? Sure. I love this conversation. And my takeaways, first of all, I think 
I feel like the biggest hidden risk here is complexity. It came out in Greg's comments about sensors, and, and it, basically everyone here was a sub sub theme of everything we heard. And I would just put notes on um, Bree's emphasis that we have to evolve our decision making processes. Fifty years ago, the decision making processes that came about because of nukes had lots of benefits in other areas beyond arms control. And I think there's a similar opportunity there. So I think we need to give Bree some budget. Um, and John Perley Barlow's comment of watching out for the aging Leviathan, I think, is, is a very powerful and unsettling statement that we should keep paying attention to the past. And the closing thought as we go into this, scenario thinking was invented around nuclear arms control. Uh, we need to apply it today. And perhaps the place we need to apply it most is what are the scary future risks beyond nukes? Nukes are the risk we know, uh, but all of us on this call know that there are some far more scary things out there we haven't talked about. So as we, as, as the community begins to tackle this question, to think about how to tackle it in a way that we look ahead to the other risks as well. Well, that is a really a terrific and, of course, unsettling way to wind up this conversation, Paul. But thank you for that. I want to I want to say thank you, Paul Sappho, for being so gracious as to to anchor this conversation. Uh, I want to note that uh, I think there's a great and interesting irony in the fact that in this conversation about the future of technology and human human technology interaction, that I was kicked off the uh, Google Hangout for a moment, but I made it back in, so uh, maybe that's a positive positive sign for all of us. Um, and uh, I just want to thank all of you, um, again, Bruce uh, and all of my colleagues at the MacArthur Foundation, at the uh, Carnegie Corporation in New York, the Plowshares Fund, the Skoll Global Threats Fund, and the Hewlett Foundation for making it possible for any of us to be here having this conversation today. Uh, and thanks to Reinventors Network for uh, for taking a chance on this subject. Uh, and for all of you who are watching, thanks so much. We look forward to all of your ideas, and we're all ears.